Welcome to The Bridgehead with Jonathan Van Maren, bringing you cutting-edge news, commentary, and interviews from the front lines of the culture wars. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Bridgehead on AM 1380 at 3 o'clock p.m. My name is Jonathan Van Maren, and I'll be your host for the next hour uh, because today we're going to actually have a very special guest on, and and we're going to we're going to be speaking with him uh, for an entire hour. One of the reasons uh, that we uh, had such a long discussion is is simply because this man's story is so fascinating. And as uh, it was Martin Luther King Jr. Day in the United States uh, just very very recently, and of course there's automatically a discussion uh, surrounding race and civil rights that takes place around that day every year, and. Uh, a man named James Work uh, is is one of the most heroic people to serve in the civil rights movement during the 1960s. Now, many of you will not recognize his name, but most of you who are in any way familiar with the history of the civil rights movement would recognize a, a famous picture of him sagging against a brick wall at a bus station in Montgomery, Alabama, uh, completely bloody and battered, and uh, there's there's a follow-up photo of him near John Lewis, who is, is now a congressman. And James Ward was only a university student when he first got involved in the civil rights movement. And because uh, pictures of, of his savage beating and an interview from his hospital bed that he doesn't actually remember at all uh, were so prominent, uh, he, he became uh, much more famous than he was, was comfortable with because uh, James Work, as you'll find out when I talk to him, is a, a very, very humble man. He was simply doing what he thought was right. He was simply trying to fight the injustice as he saw it. And when he went on the Freedom Rides, he was willing to accept what very easily could have been death. The very first time he participated in any kind of a peaceful protest, he was knocked out cold. So he, he realized what was actually uh, happening here. And I don't want to uh, uh, spoil too much of the story during the introduction because uh, James Work himself is, is a wonderful storyteller. And, and the way he told uh, this story during our interview, I think, was, was, was quite captivating and quite powerful. So uh, without any, any further ado, I'd like to present with you a, a conversation uh, between myself and civil rights hero uh, James Work, who I reached in his home in, in New Mexico, the United States. When you were a university student, what drew you into the civil rights movement in the first place? What initially, um, I guess, sparked my interest in segregation was when I went to college. My, I grew up in an all-white community, so I really was totally un, unaware and naive about what was going on in the South. But I had a black roommate my freshman year and witnessed the verbal and physical abuse that he encountered on campus, like going to the commons and, and having people get up and leave a table when we come and sit down, or just the comments that were made loud enough that he could hear them, uh, dirty fouls during intramural games, things like that. Mm -hmm. And what amazed me was that he did not reciprocate in in kind. Um, I had a very short temper. <laughs> I, I got upset that he wasn't doing anything, and, and I uh, took him to task for it, and he went over to his dresser and pulled out a copy of Dr. King's Stride Towards Freedom and said, read that, and then we'll talk about it. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, I don't know if you've ever read it, but in have, that yes. book is the story of the Montgomery bus boycott, and Dr. King outlines the six principles of nonviolence and the six steps towards bringing about social change. And I, I read it. Um, wasn't you know fantastically committed. I was, I was intrigued. I guess maybe is the right word. But anyway, as as Bob and I talked about it, he had never had any any training in nonviolence or anything. But he said, you know, the thing I realized after reading this is if I reciprocate in kind, all it's going to do is escalate the issue. Mm -hmm. 
and I choose not to do that. And I thought, oh, pretty cool, you know. Um, our school had six uh, African, well, at most time they were Negro students, five fellows and one gal. And I, I also witnessed when we went into town, there would be situations where he couldn't get a haircut to one, you know, barber wouldn't, wouldn't serve him or, or cut, cut his hair. Or, in fact, the very first night, uh, I had another roommate as well who, who ended up being the uh, quarterback of the football team. And uh, my folks took the three of us out to dinner. And we ordered and sat around, sat around, and finally somebody came and whispered in my dad's ear, and he looked quite upset and said, we're leaving. And as we got outside, he apologized to Bob mm -hmm. in that they refused to serve him. So we found another place where we were served. And, uh, but it was, it was that kind of an introduction. Um, I went through Rush and, and pledged at that point Sigma Chi, only to find out that Sigma Chi was segregated and Bob was not... Uh, allowed to come to the house, so I depledged them. Uh, my first great act of defiance, I guess. But uh, my sophomore year, Beloit uh, began an exchange program with Fisk University. And one of the black students from Fisk, uh, Beloit went down there the first half of the year, and a student from Fisk, Miss Fisk, came up. The second semester, uh, I was a sociology major, and Bob and I were living off campus uh, in one of the uh, professor's homes. And I got thinking, uh, really no intention of getting involved at all, but being a social major, I kind of was wondering, I, I wonder how it would be if I was a minority. How would I be treated? Right. And how would I react? And uh, so I applied and was accepted to go to Fisk. And that's how I ended up at Fisk my second semester of my, my junior year. And uh, it just so happened that, that the very first day I got there, it was before most of the students were there. And I went over to the student union and ordered a hamburger and fries, I guess, or a shake or something like that. Anyway, this young couple, uh, fellow students, uh, invited me to join them in their booth, and we got to talking. And, uh, of all things, the, the twist was in at that point. Right. Well, a Midwestern twist was very flat-footed, but these kids were really moving around the floor. And I said, you know, what is that dance? And they told me, and I said, well, I know how to do that. And so... His girlfriend invited me to go out on the floor, and I basically made an ass out of myself. But they started teaching me some new moves. I always loved to dance. So, anyway, we were having a wonderful, you know, wonderful conversation and getting to know each other. And I thought, wow, you know, why don't we go take in a movie? And these kids looked at me and he said, Jim, we can't go to a movie together. The movie theaters are segregated. Mm -hmm. You know, we can't enter together, we can't sit together, we can't use the same restroom, we can't use the same snack bar. And my immediate reaction was, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Right. Well, these two had been involved the previous year in the sit-ins in helping integrate the lunch counters in Nashville, or not, uh, the majority of them. And they... Uh, mentioned that they were going to be starting a campaign to integrate the movie theaters, as a matter of fact. And there was going to be a meeting that night at the professor's home from Fisk, who kind of served as a liaison to the Fisk students, and invited me to attend. So I did. Uh, anyway, to make a long story short, there was going to be a demonstration the next day. Mm -hmm. I went down and watched it. Um, kids just stood there. And I, my general feeling was this isn't accomplishing anything. So after about a half hour, I went over and uh, addressed the person at the end of the line and said, you know, I've been watching and what it was it exactly they were trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And I was re referred to their spokesman, who uh, 
was a young man at the front of the line. Right. So I went up and kind of said the same thing to him. Well, that was John Lewis. Right. And John indicated that the demonstration was going to be ending, and that if I wanted to follow them back to the church where they gathered, that he'd be happy to talk to me. And I did so, and just John is like three months younger than I am, but uh, here we were both 21, and I was in absolute awe of him. Um, it was so obvious that he was very highly respected within the movement there in Nashville. He was one of the leaders. Of, SNCC was not a, around then. They, they, there they called it the Central Committee, which mm-hmm. was about two dozen of the kids from the various schools who had proven themselves committed to nonviolence and, and uh, gone through the throes, if you will, of violence and jail and so forth. And uh, as we talked, I just, you know, the, the faith he exuded, the strength, the absolute commitment to nonviolence uh, just intrigued me. And he invited me to come that following Wednesday to a workshop on nonviolence. So I, I went and observed, and that was kind of my beginning. Yeah. Uh, I felt that I wanted to do something, but I didn't see myself ever, you know, really being nonviolent or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I helped one of the other mm-hmm. fellows start a newsletter that we would uh, put together and was distributed to the various schools talking about upcoming demonstrations. Or, uh, there was a statement of purpose that had been written, and we shared that with the students. And anyway, uh, the more I got to know the students in the group and the more workshops I attended, while I, I didn't volunteer to, to go through the testing to be a demonstrator, you didn't just go down and demonstrate. They would test you to make sure you wouldn't break. Right. But and by break, to be clear, you mean snap into violence or just run yep, away? Yep. Yes, you react. You couldn't. You wouldn't uh, remain nonviolent. Right. And they really tested. Them. I mean, this was a workshop was kind of two parts. One part was more like almost like a church service with the freedom songs and and personal testimonies as to how nonviolence had, had touched their lives or changed their lives scripture readings, the philosophical discussions of the, the principles of nonviolence, discussions of potential for violence and what actions might be taken to negate it uh, or eliminate it during a demonstration. I mean, there was a, an awful lot of that, that that kind of went on, but then there was the, the hardcore workshop where those kids who wanted or thought they wanted to demonstrate would be tested. And it was very severe role playing. Um, what, what year was this? 1961. 1961, yeah, okay. Yeah. I mean, they literally spit on them, kick them, hit them, blow smoke in their face, use every foul, derogatory name they could, uh, so forth and so on. But I would take away from the workshops what had been discussed and the instructor was a fellow by the name of Jim Lawson, who was exceptional in that he had been a seminary student at Vanderbilt and was expelled because of his anti-Vietnam War uh, activities. He spent 14 months in jail as, as being a conscientious subjector, refusing to, to sign up. But then he had gone and spent... Uh, as I recall, it was like four years uh, in India in the Gandhian Institute studying Gandhian nonviolence. And he came to know King, and it was actually King that asked him, and I think it was like 1958, something like that, to go to Nashville, that King had, had been to Nashville, saw the potential of the students there, and asked Jim to come and teach them nonviolence. And he came with, he was an ordained Christian minister, so he came with the Christian perspective of the scriptures. He was 
trained in the Gandhian nonviolence, so he had the the uh, opportunity to draw from that background as mm-hmm. well as Kingian nonviolence. So he was just an exceptional, exceptional leader, and uh, he not only taught, he was he would demonstrate right there with you. I mean, he walked the walk. The big thing that that he stressed is the the very first principle of nonviolence is that it has to become a way of life for courageous people. That uh, it could not be like a light switch to just turn on and off because if that's all it was, sooner or later you would encounter a situation where the violence would become so intense you break. Right. so anyway, I I took those lessons with me and would reread the passages from the Bible that, that were brought up and basically did an awful lot of soul searching, praying about it, um, wrestling with it on how it would impact my life and whether, you know, I grew up in a church and I, I thought I was a Christian, but some of the challenges that he had were really remarkable. And uh, it finally hit me one day that for me, as a Christian, um, the Gospels, the story of Jesus, was really the most powerful story of nonviolent direct action ever written. Mm-hmm. That Jesus embodied all those principles of nonviolence the love for your enemy, the forgiveness, the, the innocent suffering that you attempt to educate. I mean, it was all there, right. and it just hit me, and I decided at that point that I would embrace nonviolence and that I wanted to actively take part in the workshops. And so I I did, and uh, was surprised to find that, that I, I did not lash out, either verbally or physically. And uh, over a period of time, I reached the point where they said, Jim, we think you're ready. Where will you demonstrate? And my role was to go and get tickets. There were four movie theaters in four blocks. And mm-hmm. it ended up where I was able to get six pair of tickets. I had a, a partner, Bill Harbor. Um, the very first time we got tickets, we were able to get into the lobby. But... Um, we were both knocked out and thrown out on the, on the pavement and uh, did not get into the lobby until the, the movie theaters integrated several months later. But over a period of time then, I, I was the only white male student in Nashville that was demonstrating. There were some girls uh, from the, one of the schools at Vanderbilt who lived in Nashville that demonstrated. But over a period of time, being white, uh, we were kind of the f- focus when there was violence frequently. When was the first time you faced violence personally? The very first night I demonstrated, and I got knocked out. This was uh, attempting to get tickets to After the After I got the movie t- tickets, and we were trying to get into the movie theater. And who was it that knocked you out? Was it a bystander, a cop? Uh, what happened? No, it was, it was somebody that the manager of the movie theater had hired they were they were guys that were inside in the lobby just they were there to keep people out Mm -hmm. i mean the non-whites out and i don't think you know they didn't realize that i had a ticket and being white they didn't recognize me at that point i was my first demonstration and so when i turned to to bill we were right there at the door and were able to get through them they hadn't locked the doors because there were still white patrons going in to, to see the movies so that, that must have been a, a real catalyst moment as well, where you went from the uh, the practice trial runs and the discussion and, and the philosophical acceptance of the tenets of nonviolence, but then to actually face the violence yourself, but choose to keep going with it. That must have been almost a, a secondary, but still very crucial decision point. Well, it the thing was, the more you you became involved the more experience you had, um, the deeper uh, your faith became, your commitment became. There was such a a powerful bond 
between the students. I mean, we knew each other, you know, if, if you, you were going to encounter violence, that every other student there was giving you their strength. So you were able to take so much more than you could individually, probably. And, and over the months, uh, it was recognized that uh, I, my commitment was deepening and my faith was deepening. We really knew that there was a power that was working in us and through us. We felt that very, very strongly. And uh, I was selected to be, uh, become a member of that central committee uh, after a period of time. And I was in that capacity. I mean, in that capacity, I was, uh, if, if students would come from out of town to, you know, they'd heard about nonviolence or demonstrations or whatever the city is, we'd, they'd ask for panels or they'd ask for students that were involved to come and talk to them. And I was frequently one of the members of those panels. A lot of times it was John Lewis and Diane Nash and, and Bernard Lafayette and myself to explain why we were involved. Why is a white guy involved in this? You know, and it is because it's not a black and white issue. It's an issue of justice and freedom and equality. The, but, one of the things that seems to be missing in a lot of the discussion, and it's interesting because I've, I've seen this not only in your story, but in Martin Luther King Jr.'s autobiography, and in fact, in almost every book, every memoir written by uh, the original civil rights movement, is that it was very fundamentally a movement driven by Christian belief, just as, as you've described. Absolutely. And I don't think anyone who listens to Martin Luther King Jr.'s speeches can get around the fact that oh, if, no. if you want no. to quote I, him, and, you have to and almost I think, avoid it. Well, one of, the, one of the things that's often overlooked is uh, where did we meet? In churches, who are our adult advisors, if you will, ordained clergymen? Uh, I mean, ultimately, it, it grew beyond just the Christian. It was the Jew, Judaic Christian background. Um, I mean, most of these kids were were probably Baptist. Uh, from their experience, we met in the Baptist church there. Uh, and the minister there was kind of our our adult contact. He was just Reverend Kelly Miller Smith was his name, and he was uh, he was kind of a, the Dr. King of, of Nashville. He was a wonderful man, um, always available to talk to you, uh, listen to what you had to say, and, and you know give his his wisdom, uh, whether you agreed with it or not. Mm -hmm. uh, is when when we learned, uh, you know, John had uh, been selected to go on the core ride, and it happened that he was uh, invited to have an interview for uh, I think it was graduate school at another spot. That he wasn't on the buses when the bus was firebombed in Anniston, the one bus, and the other bus got to Birmingham, and the people were so savagely beaten. But when we heard of that, the, the Central Committee immediately had a meeting and, and called the minister in Birmingham, who was a fellow by the name of Fred Shuttlesworth. We sent a wire down through him to the students, or to the to the core writers, because they weren't just students. They, they were, had people in their 60s. But, you know, expressing their support and hang tough and, and so forth. But if you recall, that's when Bobby Kennedy sent John Sigenthaler out to try and quash the thing. And I guess I, I, I'd have to say the majority of the writers on the core, in the core uh, group, were not long term committed nonviolent folks. I mean, Jim Peck, the guy that was so savagely beaten in Birmingham, was uh, James Farmer, the leader of CORE. But Several of the of the students and, and the uh, adults only got like two weeks of nonviolent training. Right. Uh, so they didn't have the depth of experience or commitment that we had in Nashville. And Sigenthaler was able to convince them to quit. So overnight, eventually, the first time there was a, a bomb threat on a plane, but 
ultimately they flew out of Birmingham to New Orleans. And when we heard that, we were extremely alarmed because our view was that that gave the impression or would leave the impression with the segregationists that all they had to do was become violent enough mm-hmm. and, you know, you turn tail and run. And our feeling was that, you know, if if that was the impression that was left, it could set back the movement years, if not decades. Right. So our immediate decision was that the ride had to be continued, that, and that we were the logical ones to continue that ride because we had just we we'd successfully integrated the movie theaters. We did not have a new campaign plan at that point. Uh, the biggest thing was was coming up with the logistics of. Uh, who would go, what would be the makeup, where would we go, how would we go, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Where would we get the money from the tickets? So we spent uh, several hours wrestling with that, and ultimately uh, were able to obtain the money for the tickets. We had talked to King and Farmer, both of who said, don't go, you're going to get, you know, it's a, you're going to get killed, basically. And it was reiterated over and over and over again. Probably 18 of the 24 students had volunteered to go. But that um, you needed to understand you know, that you either were probably going to get arrested, you were going to get beaten, or you're going to get killed. And you needed to realize what you were putting on the line. We were leaving during finals week, so we were all going to miss our finals. Didn't know how that would impact, you know, uh, if we lived through it. All of us were recommended to go back and talk to our our teachers and the dean of students to see if if they would let us take finals over if we lived through it. And Diane suggested the 10 of us that were selected to go on the first ride. I figured I'd be selected because I felt our ride had to be integrated just as the core ride had been, that again, we should write some kind of note to our loved ones and leave them with her in the event we were killed, yeah, and that she would forward it to our parents mm-hmm. or our family or whoever it might have been. And, and and it was just a matter of you know getting on the bus. And what happened next is, is, is rather famous in the annals of, of civil rights. There's the interview you gave from the hospital bed. There's the front pages of the newspapers, and there's the famous photos. What was it like for the with with the bus that particular freedom ride arriving in Montgomery? Well, you know, we'd been arrested in Birmingham. I'd been arrested along with Paul Brooks. We sat up front and broke the law right off the bat. And uh, Bull Connors arrested us outside, right at the city limits. But then. He took the rest under protective custody, and I think you probably recall dumped them at the state line Mm -hmm. that first night. Well, Paul and I were still in jail. We spent two and a half days in the Birmingham jail before uh, we went to court. And at that point, the the judge had learned that Greyhound was going to take us on to Montgomery, so our sentences were passed over. It was going to be three months and a $50 fine, as I recall. And they set it aside and just kind of told us, get on the bus and get out of town. So that day when we got out, that was the 19th then, we went to Reverend Shuttlesworth and were able to shower and clean up a little bit. And then eventually went back down to the bus station. And the second group from Nashville, the Bernard Lafayette had, had was the spokesman for, had joined us. So instead of 10, we were at 21 students. We sat in the bus terminal that night with the Klan marching out in front in their hoods and at 10 the next morning got on the bus from Montgomery. And it was, uh, you know, we we were supposedly guaranteed protection. Right. Lloyd Mann had had guaranteed our protection to Montgomery and the police commissioner of Montgomery said he would provide protection for us there, which was a lie. Uh, He told the Klan they'd have 30 minutes before any police would show up. 
But we did have full protection all the way to Montgomery. So that was a, a relaxing trip. I mean, Alabama was beautiful. I mean, it, it was mid-May. Right. Uh, everything was turning green and flowers starting to bloom. And, you know, the grass was nice and green. So it was really a, an enjoyable trip. The, the bus driver just put the pedal to the metal, so we were just flying down the freeway. When we hit Montgomery, we realized that the protection was gone. And the closer we got to the, to the bus terminal, within just a couple blocks, you realized that there was no vehicular traffic. And you didn't see any pedestrians walking around. As we drove into, pulled into the, to the terminal, Catherine Burke, noticed the squad car pulling out and she pointed it out and I remember John said something like oh that's not a good that's not good or that's not a good sign something like that uh, we pulled in and got off the bus got our, our suitcases we had hoped uh, we had talked to, to Ralph Abernathy's Ralph Abernathy and we're hoping to have members of his congregation meet us at the bus terminal so that we could disperse into the community. It was just an idea to try to alleviate any, any violence upon our arrival, but obviously uh, there was no vehicular traffic, <laughs> so right. they didn't have any chance to get there. It was very, I guess the biggest thing was how quiet it was. There were a few press people there, John was our spokesman, and uh, as he approached the microphone, that's when this one fellow that I guess was a used car salesman or something um, went at, at the media. And first he grabbed a parabolic mic and away from the fellow and threw it to the ground, stopped it, and then he went at one of the photographers and was trying to get his camera and in the process threw him to the ground and was kicking at him. And that seemed to be the cue and uh, around the bus bays and up the driveways came the mob, just you know, screaming, get them, get them, kill them, get the niggers. And you could see the weapons uh, they were carrying, and just the hatred on their faces, and uh, knew that, that we were in for a beating, and, and that's when I bowed my head and prayed. And I'd ask God to be with me and give me the strength to remain nonviolent and to forgive him. And I encountered the most incredible religious experience of my life because I did indeed feel a, a presence, a, I don't know how to really express it, but a, just like I was surrounded with this incredible love and peace and knew in that instant that whether I lived or whether I died, it was going to be okay. And then I got beat up. And beat up badly from the pictures that are, are now famous. Yeah, they uh, had a severe concussion and I guess three cracked vertebrae, broken nose. Do you know who it was that beat you? Clan. The, the gals uh, were able to commandeer a taxi. African American gals. And one of the gals, Lucretia Collins, has said that as they were pulling out, she looked back and saw that two guys were holding me and women were kicking me in the groin. And uh, there were some mothers that were holding their children up to, to scratch my face. Wow. But that I was unconscious. I mean, I didn't. Luckily, I. I was rendered unconscious quite quickly. Uh, when I was grabbed, they pulled me over a railing and fell to the ground on all fours. And that's when I got kicked in the spine and probably my vertebrae were cracked. But I flew forward, went over on my back, and a boot came down in my face. And that's basically the last thing I remember till I, I woke up briefly sitting in the back of a vehicle. And... Uh, John was there and handed me his handkerchief to wipe off blood. And I was out again. I woke up briefly in the hospital 
and then I didn't wake up for about two days. I, I was totally, I, I was not aware of the interview. I remember vaguely some bright lights, and that's it. So, were uh, were you taken to the hospital by ambulance? No, I was taken to the hospital by Floyd Mann, his his people. He showed up, and uh, I met the the uh, patrolman that uh, was called upon. I didn't. At one point, I was told that a, a black minister took me in his home, in his vehicle, but. At the uh, 50th, when we were in Montgomery, at Reverend Abernathy's church, this white fellow came up to me and said, I'm the guy that took you to the hospital. And at that point, they were rushing John and myself to an interview with NBC down in the church office. Mm -hmm. And when I got back, he was gone. But I eventually found out his name and and talked with him, and he, he explained that the white ambulances refused to take me, and the black ambulances were afraid to take me. Right. So I basically lay on the tarmac for about a half an hour. And then Floyd went up to him and said, you know, where are you parked? And he said where he was. He said, bring your car around. And he drove, Floyd Mann sat in the front passenger seat, and there was another fellow that it was interrogating me apparently in the back seat as we rode to the hospital. And how did your family react when they saw the imagery of you on while you were in, you were on the newspaper? Of course, there was the interview that you don't remember. This became one of the most public events that the civil rights movement had done in a long time because they hadn't seen violence that vicious in quite some time. Well. It's funny because, you know, Jim Peck had a lot of violence when he hit Birmingham. But again, the the picture didn't seem to go nationwide. I think it was partially because we were young that it did go literally around the world, those pictures. As a matter of fact, I had a cousin in Russia at the time. He uh, was an expert in pipe organs. He was the head of the Conservatory of Music and at the university in my hometown, and he was over there inspecting old organs in the various cathedrals in Russia. And he was riding a train, and this Russian sitting next to him had a paper and was started going on about the Amerikanskis and so forth and so on. And he pointed to this picture, and my cousin looked and said, my God, it's my cousin. And he said he couldn't buy himself a drink for about the next week. <laughs> But, of course, my parents were shocked. I had called them, and they knew uh, what I was going to be doing. But it, it was it was hard for them. Were, were they supportive? Because I know, based on how they treated uh, you know your your friend Bob from university, that they were not at all in favor of segregation or racism at the same time. No, it was one of the things that, that certainly helped influence me and, and gave me guidance. and um, Mixed feelings, because... Uh, you know, they didn't want me to go, and I had said, you know, I, I've got to go. It's it's, it's something that uh, I, I just feel so certain that this is what God wants me to do with my life right now. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really not open to discussion. I love you guys. Um, so we had, we talked about it long and hard, but over the years and everything, you know, uh, they became very supportive. What were the years uh, after that sort of very high-profile event like? Because, of course, the Civil Rights Act got signed in 1964. Were you part of the, the March on Washington in 1963? No. Uh, I was in seminary at the time. That September after, after the ride, first of all, I went home. Our associate minister flew down and rode home with me. And had an initial two weeks there to kind of just, you know, see my parents and let them see that I was still alive. <laughs> right. But mm -hmm. I, uh, Fisk had agreed to let me come back down and take finals. So my brother drove me down. And I, I was really wrestling with the situation. At that point, I was not aware of my broken vertebrae. All I knew is that I just had severe back pain. And almost all the way driving down 
we had a little Nash Rambler, and I had that seat flat uh, while my brother drove. But I was walking over to take a, an exam, and there was this bar. I don't even I don't know what the purpose of it was that came out perpendicular to a telephone pole, and it was just a habit that we jump up and bap it. And I proceeded to try and do that, and I shouldn't have, because I obviously put a strain on those vertebrae, and I passed out from the pain. And some of the students that were there carried me over to Meharry Medical School, which was right there, I mean, right next to Fisk. And they did the x-rays, and that's where they found the, the broken vertebrae. And so they basically all I could do was put strips of uh, medical tape from my buttocks to my shoulder blades. <laughs> Little yeah. did I know I was allergic to it. But um, all the, everybody basically what, what they had attempted to do was, of course, by this time, people were coming from all over the, the country. And they had tried to establish areas where interested parties would go for nonviolent training. And one of them was Nashville and Greensboro, and there were a couple of other locations. Well, I went over to the office where we met, and there was nobody there. All the the students, of course, school was out, and and all the leadership was down in prison, right, in Jackson. And I felt really bad about that. And I, now that they, I knew I had these broken vertebrae. Uh, and the doctors were saying, you can't, you know, you can't do anything. You can't go anywhere. Uh, you just need to go home and heal. Because I really was wrestling with, you know, I should be with my brothers and sisters down there mm-hmm. uh, after the after the finals. But it ended up where I went, you know, ended up where I went home and healed. And, and then in September, Dr. King's SCLC honored the ton of us that continued the ride with their Freedom Award for that year. And they held the meeting in in Nashville, and uh, I think he did it with all ten of us. But I I literally had a, a one-on-one with Dr. King for about a half an hour. What was that like? And he was, you know, where, where are you? Are you? I was being approached to help in the voter registration freedom summer down in the South, and I was wrestling with that, or should I stay in school? Anyway, we talked for about a half an hour, and I, I had told him that initially I had been wrestling with the possibility of going into the ministry. And he said, Jim, you do that. Then continue your education and, and go into the pastorate, and you'll touch a lot of lives. Just, you know, keep preaching that message of love and nonviolence and forgiveness, and, you know, the whole Christian gospel. And I took his advice, and so when, you know, I went back to my college to graduate and then proceeded on to seminary. Looking back at those years, what's the thing that stands out for you the most now? The years after or what? Uh, Yeah, the years just after that where you're sort of almost decompressing from this intense experience that you've been living through. Uh, Boy, it was a decompression. That was very difficult. Uh, that was, you know, as, as Dr. King said before he was killed, kind of being to the mountaintop. It was a mountaintop experience. Uh, incredible bond between us, the students, the love we shared, the commitment we shared. During those months, I guess, you know, I was never so spiritually alive. Uh, I would, As I said earlier, I was never so certain that that I was indeed doing what God wanted me to do with my life at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, prayer had become so much, so meaningful, and and the reading of scriptures just just took on a a significance. It brought so much comfort and encouragement uh, during those those months. There were certain passages that just uh, helped so much. And it was while I was constantly being asked to speak and, and share my experiences, uh, it was also very difficult because you were trying to, 
explain a life-altering experience to people that just, kind of like me the first time I read Stride Towards Freedom, can't really grasp how powerful that whole element of, of living your faith is and was. So it wasn't easy, uh, but the the wonderful thing was while I I didn't you know live in the South, I was back in, in the North. Uh, over the years, there are those that we have maintained communication with and, and seen on a, a relatively regular basis. Uh, and every time we get together, the, the years just roll back, and the love is there, and, and you—it all comes back. It, it's just that element has been wonderful over the years, and it's just literally been kind of this last uh, year or two since uh, we've moved into rural New Mexico. Uh, we're 50 miles away from our nearest grocery store. Okay. That. Uh, I still will talk to kids uh, about History Day type thing, but I, I don't do speeches anymore. Uh, it just takes too much out of me, and and with my arthritis and artificial knees and stuff, I just uh, it's it's just too emotionally and spiritually draining. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you for taking the time to talk to us. You're very welcome. Oh, one last thing for young people today: your story is 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 so interesting because. You tell it like it was, how you saw it, how important faith was as a part of it, not just as a social movement, but as you say, also a, a very Christian movement. What what sort of... I'll lesson? say spiritual movement rather than Christian, because it took in all faiths over a period of time. What's the one thing that people today can take from your experience? What would you want them to take from your experience? I guess the big, biggest thing I have tried to stress with people is, you know, you don't have to do or get involved in some national event or movement. The day-to-day kindnesses, to look around where you are in school, bullying is an issue. You know, new kid comes to school, instead of ignoring them, make them welcome. Uh, I happen to have a grandchild that, that I have cerebral palsy. Uh, I feel very strongly that the physically and mentally disabled uh, are often overlooked. That's where money seems to get cut the most in schools and things. Mm-hmm. But Gandhi had a wonderful story of the starfish. Are you acquainted with that? Mm-hmm. Yes. That, I, I frequently would end a speech with that. You know, here's something where the guy says, you know, it's not going to make any difference. Look at all these. And he takes the starfish and throws it in. It says it makes the world a lifetime of difference to that one. Yeah. And that's the thing. You know, if you touch one life and make a difference in one life, and that person goes on and, and does likewise, it's growing. You can keep that faith alive and and. It doesn't have to be a monumental thing. That's the wonderful thing about it, is, is by just doing a loving act of kindness, you can literally change a person's life. Yeah. Just do it. Mm-hmm. Don't sit and wait for somebody else to do it. Yeah. Well, Mr. Spurg, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. We really appreciate You're it. You're very welcome. Have a wonderful Take day. Care. Bye. Bye-bye. Ladies and gentlemen, that was former freedom rider and civil rights hero James Zwerg speaking to me uh, from his home in New Mexico about his experiences in the civil rights movement. And uh, I think what really had struck me the most about about James Zwerg's dedication was he talked about uh, the joy in those circumstances where you can be facing a lot of hostility. Things uh, can be very, very 
ugly often. Uh, there could be people screaming and shouting and disagreeing with you, but the camaraderie and the love he felt for those uh, that he faced the fight with uh, were what carried him through. And, and how when he visited them, it was like it was like they were there again doing the same thing, going into battle for human rights. So I, I, I've admired uh, Mr. Zwerg for years since I first heard of his story about six years ago, and I really hope that, that you took out of the story uh, what I did. Thanks so much uh, for tuning in, and uh, we hope that you'll tune in again next week. We have another a very fascinating interview. It will be an interview, actually, uh, with a Holocaust survivor who survived uh, five separate concentration camps. We'll be airing that for the 71st anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. And if any of you uh, want to catch these shows online, uh, just uh, type in The Bridgehead on SoundCloud. We upload them all there. Uh, TheBridgehead.ca as well. We post all of the interviews uh, online afterwards, and, and you can also find us in uh, on YouTube at The Bridgehead. So if any of you would like to follow up on these shows, then, then you can do so online. Thanks again so much for joining us, and we hope you'll join us again next week.